Hello, I'm Jason Kendall, and I've been going through Dr. Barbara Ryden's textbook, Introduction to Cosmology. This is Chapter 3, Section 3, The General Way of Einstein. I'm glad you're watching, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my Patreon supporters and my YouTube members. Their support means a lot to me, since it does keep this channel going. And if you like what's been happening on this channel so far, please consider joining up. I also give special perks and advanced views to my supporters. And now on with relativity. Specifically, how did Einstein geometrize gravity? And where did that idea come from? Previously, I described the successes of special relativity. However, its true usefulness can be seen to be quite limited. It only applies in situations where gravity is non-existent. Now, Einstein knew this, and so he struggled for a decade to extend special relativity into the realm of gravity. In 1907, he discovered that if you have two apparently quite different measurement frames, one subject to a constant gravitational field causing acceleration, and the other subject to a constant acceleration, such as a rocket far away from any gravitational field, identical physical laws are observed in both frames. His version of the Newtonian equivalence principle that was consistent with special relativity meant that because the physical laws in both frames are the same, Einstein assumed that the gravitational field and the acceleration were physically equivalent. And Einstein stated this as a hypothesis in 1907. We assume the complete physical equivalence of a gravitational field and a corresponding acceleration of the reference system. Then in 1911, Einstein used his equivalence principle to predict that clocks run at different rates in a gravitational potential and light rays bend in a gravitational field. This connected the equivalence principle to his earlier principles of special relativity. This assumption of exact physical equivalence makes it impossible for us to speak of the absolute acceleration of the system of reference. Just as the usual theory of relativity forbids us to talk about the absolute velocity of a system, and it makes the equal falling of all bodies in a gravitational field seem a matter of course. After his successful integration of special relativity into the mathematical framework of differentiable Riemannian manifolds in 1915, Einstein recalled the role of the equivalence principle. The breakthrough came suddenly one day. I was sitting in a chair in my patent office in Bern. Suddenly, a thought struck me. If a man falls freely, he would not feel his weight. I was taken aback. This simple thought experiment made a deep impression on me and led me to the theory of gravity. The equivalence principle underpins the entire concept of the modern conceptualization of gravity, that it is not a force, but rather a curvature of space-time that is intrinsic to space-time. This is different than the idea of an extrinsic curvature, where you have, say, a cylinder in space. The cylinder itself on the surface has no intrinsic curvature. And if you're riding around on the surface, you can do all of Euclid's axioms for a flat surface. To show that this is true, just remember that a cylinder can be made very easily by taking a flat sheet of paper and curling one edge around to the other side. Therefore, on the sheet of paper, you haven't changed anything. You've simply taken the paper and connected one side to the other. That still is intrinsically flat on the surface. Now, of course, it's been bent through the third dimension of space. That doesn't really matter here. If you see the cylinder from above or away from it, then of course, the surface is curved around. This distinction is important for the concept of general relativity. But the intuition for this arises only out of studying and internalizing the very important core idea of the equivalence principle. Today, we speak of the three different versions of the equivalence principle, and I'll go over each and give some examples. Then I'm going to discuss some of the modern tests and finish up with a brief description of what we mean by straight lines in a curved spacetime. First, let's go back and look at Galileo's and Newton's version of the equivalence principle. In my previous video titled The Way of Newton, I went into some detail about this, including current tests around it. We'll now take a refresher in what's called the weak equivalence principle. Let's reach back to when Galileo compared different materials experimentally. 
he determined that the acceleration due to gravitation is independent of the amount of mass being accelerated. To be fair, he didn't call it gravity. He made observations about falling and rolling objects. Sometime around 1590, Galileo Galilei, while he was a professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa, was said to have dropped unequal weights of the same material from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Being a generally grumpy guy, he wanted to disprove Aristotle's theory of gravity. Aristotle wrote that objects fall with a speed proportional to their mass, and Galileo was nearly certain it was false. Primarily, Aristotle hadn't done any actual experiments, but just logicked it out. To accomplish this weighty defenestration, Galileo wanted to show that the time it took for different weights to hit the ground was independent of their mass. Perhaps they were two differently massed iron balls, perhaps something less destructive to the pavement below, we don't really know. In any event, according to the story, Galileo saw that they hit the ground at nearly the same moment, and judging by the sounds when they hit, that they'd accelerated in their fall, and further, that they fell with the same acceleration. This proved his prediction, and at the same time disproved Aristotle's theory of gravity. This was one of the many things Galileo did to upset the apple cart. He had hypothesized that the distance covered by a falling object is proportional to the square of the time elapsed since it was dropped. And in 1604, Galileo successfully measured this very acceleration of falling objects using the timing of his heartbeat. The result was published in The Two Sciences in 1638. In the same book, Galileo suggested that the variances of the speeds of falling objects of different mass was due to air resistance, and that objects would fall completely uniformly in a vacuum. And that's what we're seeing Apollo astronaut David Scott test on the moon back in 1971 with the hammer and the falcon feather. Just 50 years after Galileo, Newton developed the differing concepts of gravitational and inertial mass. He then compared the periods of pendulums composed of different materials to verify that these masses are the same. His discovery became known as the weak equivalence principle. The weak equivalence principle, also known as the universality of freefall or the Galilean equivalence principle, can be stated in a quite detailed language as follows. All uncharged, freely falling test particles follow the same trajectories once an initial position and velocity have been established. Further, in a uniform gravitational field, the acceleration of each test particle is completely independent of its properties, including rest mass and composition, and finally, each test particle falls with exactly the same acceleration. I described this at length in the first video in the chapter of The Way of Newton. It bears repeating that in order to make this statement, Newton had to assume that forces arise from everyday actions, like lifting things off the ground, pushing things across a table, and launching a rocket with chemical explosives, are all due to natural forces. The inclusion of gravity as a force with no discernible means of action was greatly troubling to Newton. Going back to his statement, which was a core of his finding in his 1687 masterwork, Philosophia Naturalis Principia, mass and weight are locally in identical ratios for all bodies. It's also important to note that this caused a lot of consternation in the world of science. Here, we see the origin of the idea that gravity is a force to be put on equal footing with the force a horse exerts while pulling on a carriage. This way of thinking also draws on the idea that objects are held together by some intermolecular forces and not gravitationally. The freely falling objects discussed using the weak equivalence principle are bound together by non-gravitational forces. This would apply to apples and oranges and to boulders and feathers. In sum, the weak equivalence principle merely states that all objects fall at the same rate in a gravitational field regardless of their mass. The Einstein equivalence principle states that inertial and free-falling systems are entirely equivalent. In such laboratories, there is no experiment of any kind that is capable of distinguishing between inertial and free-falling motion. This is because the Einstein principle of equivalence declares that the acceleration of a free-falling laboratory completely cancels out the effect of gravity not only dynamically, as in the weak equivalence principle, but also in any conceivable experiment in any branch of science. Therefore, special relativity, and not just Newtonian mechanics, may then be used in free-falling systems as well as inertial systems. There are only a few limitations to the Einstein equivalence principle. 
Well, the main one is that the experiments conducted can't be ones that involve self-gravitating properties. We'd need to test electromagnetic interactions or, say, the weak nuclear force interactions. Indeed, one main motivation for the Einstein equivalence principle, or just EEP, is in trying to integrate the theory of electromagnetism into the framework of gravity. So let's get into the details on this. What is now called the Einstein equivalence principle states first that the weak equivalence principle holds. Then, to complete his work on gravity, Einstein included two more ideas into his form of the equivalence principle, local Lorentz invariance and local positional invariance. Local Lorentz invariance means that no matter how the experimental laboratory is freely falling with respect to the ambient gravitational field, inside the laboratory frame, all experiments done in that frame will be measured as in an inertial frame. In other words, the outcome of any local non-gravitational experiment is independent of the velocity of the freely falling reference frame in which it's performed. This is exactly like being down in the hold of Galileo's boat. Now, in addition to sailing on a glassy sea at constant speed in one direction, we can now surprise poor Galileo by dropping his boat from a great height or sending him flying into space in orbit around the moon. Such a spacefaring, freely falling Galilean boat might have floating fish and water droplets hovering stationarily in the air, or, as we see Commander Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station, one can juggle balls by simply placing them where you want them to be. They'll just stay there, because they're simply falling at the same rate as everything around them. But as the ISS goes around the Earth at 90 minutes per orbit, it experiences changes in the gravitational field. Other than the tiny effects due to non-uniformity of the gravitational field, Commander Kelly's experiments aboard the ISS are in nearly perfect inertial reference frame. The speed, altitude, and direction of the ISS through the Earth's gravitational field doesn't affect, except at tiny levels, the fact that it's fully equivalent to the ISS being deep in space, far away from any gravitational field whatsoever. In many ways, the concept of local Lorentz invariance is essentially where special relativity gets integrated into general relativity. It's truly astounding the scale and amount of experimental support for special relativity that has led it to being central to all physics. The vast supporting experimental evidence for the Lore local Lorentz invariance includes, of course, the classic Michelson-Morley experiment and tests of time dilation by Eves and Stilwell and Rossi and Hall, tests of whether the speed of light is independent of the velocity of the source, using both binary X-ray stellar sources, where the source of photons is coming from an accretion disk around a stellar mass black hole, and secondly, high-energy pions impinging on the Earth's upper atmosphere and cosmic rays. There are also numerous tests of isotropy of the speed of light, which would of course violate local Lorentz invariance. In addition to these direct experiments, advancements in quantum mechanics have cemented local Lorentz invariance via special relativity's integration. Specifically, Dirac's equation predicted antiparticles and quantum spin, which then spawned the stunningly successful relativistic theory of quantum electrodynamics. In 2024, 119 years after the introduction of special relativity, it is actually safe to ask what is there left to test. Special relativity, and therefore local Lorentz invariance, has been so thoroughly integrated into all modern physics that its validity is rarely challenged, except by cranks and crackpots. Interestingly then, since the early 2000s, legitimate theoretical and experimental efforts have been undertaken to find violations of special relativity. This is because the promise of quantum gravity theories to seek new physics that extends Einstein's relativity. This doesn't mean relativity will be replaced or invalidated, but it means that new interactions yet unseen remain to be revealed. Such models predict apparent or effective violations of Lorentz invariance. Quantum gravity, in general, asserts that there is a fundamental length scale given by the Planck length, which is 10 to the minus 35th meters. But length is not an invariant quantity due to special relativistic length contraction. So there might be something there to seemingly violate local Lorentz invariance. Next, in a brain world, with our universe embedded in some higher dimensional bulk, like we saw in the movie Interstellar, 
the confinement of normal physics interactions to our four-dimensional brain could induce apparent Lorentz violating effects for us while leaving it locally invariant in the higher dimensional bulk world. And finally, string theory or M-theory suggest effective or apparent violations due to the existence of new and additional scale, vector, and tensor long-range fields which couple to the normal matter. This last one's getting way ahead of ourselves, though. Let's now look at local positional invariants. This means that no matter where or when in the universe we put our laboratory frame, there won't be any difference between the frame's measurements. This has huge implications for physics. One of the most important results is that the physical constants of nature, such as Newton's gravitational constant and the fine structure constant, are not functions of space and time. They don't change. This means they are profoundly elemental to the physics of our universe. Of course, this is going to lead to some very interesting tests, which I'll talk about later. Here, the local in local positional invariance and local Lorentz invariance means that the experimental setup in the laboratory must be small compared to variations in the gravitational field. These, of course, would be the tidal forces, and the test experiment must be small enough so that the gravitational potential does not alter the result. Just adding the constraints of local Lorentz invariance and local positional invariance, Einstein was able to predict the gravitational redshift, which has subsequently been observed. Theories of gravity that obey the Einstein equivalence principle are forced to be what we call metric theories of gravity. Such theories mean that all freely falling bodies follow trajectories that are things we call straight lines in curved spacetime, geodesics. I'll get into the definition of a geodesic later on in this video, but suffice it to say that it's the shortest distance in a curved spacetime. So, to recap so far, the differences. In the weak equivalence principle, we have that the inertial mass and the gravitational mass of any object are equal, or equivalently, in small enough regions of spacetime, the motion of freely falling particles in a gravitational field are identical to motions in a uniformly accelerated frame. In contrast, the Einstein equivalence principle states that, in small enough regions of spacetime, the non-gravitational laws of physics reduce to those of special relativity, and it's impossible to detect the existence of a gravitational field by means of local experiments. Gravity, then, couples not only to rest mass, like the leaning tower of Pisa of Galileo, but also to all forms of non-gravitational energy and momentum, such as the electromagnetic binding energy of atoms and molecules, and makes any experiment useless to test the difference between an inertial frame and a freely falling frame. And now let's see how we can take it a step further. The strong equivalence principle applies the same constraints as the Einstein equivalence principle, but allows the freely falling bodies to be massive gravitating objects as well as test particles. Thus, the strong equivalence principle applies to objects that exert a gravitational force on themselves, such as stars and planets, black holes, and Cavendish experiments. I alluded to some of the results of this just a bit ago as part of the Einstein equivalence principle. This does make it a bit fuzzy between the two, and clarifying exactly what a non-gravitational experiment truly is does come up as a matter of debate among physicists. For this purpose, the strong equivalence principle, in order to have gravitational interactions explicitly obey the universality of freefall, local Lorentz invariance and local positional invariance creates the strongest possible restrictions on theories of gravity. Namely, the strong equivalence principle requires that the gravitational constant be the same everywhere and every when in the universe. The SEP then says there are no other forces other than what we've already discovered. There would only be gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. These are the only allowed interactions of matter, and this is the standard model. That's what we mean by the statement that the strong equivalence principle is incompatible with a fifth force. Like the Einstein equivalence principle, the strong principle requires gravity to be geometrical in nature, but in addition, it forbids any extra fields. Therefore, the metric alone determines all effects of gravity. Why? If an observer measures a patch of space to be without curvature of any kind, then the strong principle suggests that it is absolutely equivalent to any other patch of flat space elsewhere in the universe.
and else when in the universe. Matter in all flat spaces in the cosmos for all time behave and interact in exactly the same ways. Einstein's theory of general relativity, even including the cosmological constant, is thought to be the only theory of gravity that satisfies the strong equivalence principle. There do exist a number of alternate theories, such as Brand's Dickey theory and the Einstein ether theory. These theories add additional fields and state that the metric is not the sole determining factor in the free falling movement of matter in spacetime. Also, like I stated earlier, grand unified theories that combine electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and strong nuclear force with gravity in some way, as well as quantum gravity theories, all require additional fields in order to couple spacetime itself to phenomena that would then eventually violate local Lorentz and positional invariances. For the rest of this course on Ryden's introductory cosmology, we're going to work inside a physics framework of the strong equivalence principle. Amazingly, that's all we'll need for almost all studies of the universe that track its evolution and fate from here to the wildly unforeseeable future. It also takes us all the way back to the first tiny fractions of the first second of the universe's existence. It also works for more mundane things, like your GPS system and local satellite orbital mechanics. Adding in quantum gravity to our study of classical relativistic cosmology will only get muddled by such considerations. However, once we get into the realm of the inflationary epoch and inside the first second of the Big Bang, we will need to return to this topic again. In general, for everything we'll need, we'll encounter in cosmology, we'll likely use the strong equivalence principle. A big caveat is, of course, the current debate over the Hubble tension. This may promise to see violations of the strong equivalence principle by introducing new physics evident in the observation. But that's for another day. For now, let's look at a bunch of examples and thought experiments about the equivalence principle so we can get a good feeling for what it means. First, let's look at the basic idea that Einstein used to develop the concept of gravity. His great insight was, a falling man does not feel his own weight. As you can see from this diagram, you've got a man, and he's in a box, which happens to be a room or laboratory, and he's floating in space. He's freely falling inside this box with everything else, all falling at the same rate towards the Earth, or if he's deep in space, far, far, far away from everything. These two situations, according to Einstein's equivalence principle, are exactly identical. We will call them free-falling or inertial frames, and we're going to justify that later with many examples. Next, to see the effect of Einstein equivalence principle, let's take this guy and put him in a deep space. He's got his laboratory, and inside this laboratory, floating far from anywhere, he's pointing a laser across the lab at the far wall. In addition, there's some magnets at rest. These will, of course, make no electric currents in nearby conductors unless he starts moving the magnet around. Further, Observations of atoms and molecules from chemistry experiments or spectroscopic measurements will not experience Doppler broadening or any redshift or blue shift. Nuclear processes behave as they do in any laboratory at rest. They'll just behave normally. Well, as normal as it is to be floating out in space far away from any gravity. And finally, let's say we have two balls of the same mass but different compositions. They're just going to float there, maintaining their relative positions. This would also be true if they're made of the same stuff, but of differing masses. As the experimenter does more and more thorough experiments, he or she would discover that the laws of special relativity hold in the laboratory for all experiments, because at this point, they're far, far away from any gravitational fields. So any small-scale laboratory tests that involve speeds close to that of light will show time dilation, length contraction, and clock desynchronization. This is exactly what is known from special relativity, which I talked about previously. But now, sometime later, the lab drifts closer to some star and gets caught in its orbit. The lab begins to fall freely around the star, changing speed as per Kepler's laws, speeding up when it gets closer and slowing down when it gets farther. Since the lab is small with respect to the gravitational field, or if the gravitational field is not extremely strong and there are no windows, the experimenter will not be able to tell that they're in orbit they're freely falling around the star. It'll be just the same as if they're floating out deep in space as before. There'll be no experiment that will be able to show that they're in orbit around a star. And of course, I'm ignoring the non-uniformity of this gravitational field. There will, of course, be tidal forces due to that. But removing that, we can make the orbit large, like the size of Jupiter's orbit at about five astronomical units. 
that should do it. Unless, of course, the lab then falls towards Jupiter or whatever. In general, though, in a locally uniform gravitational field, our intrepid experimenter or trapped experimenter doomed to work alone in a windowless box will still think they're out blissfully deep in outer space. Let's look at one experiment on Vord, a laser. In both instances, we see the labs are freely falling. In both cases, we say they are in inertial reference frames and the laser goes across the room in what the experimenter measures to be a straight line. On the right, deep in space, far away from any gravitational source, he shoots the laser across and it hits the far wall straight. The same will happen if you're freely falling in the Earth's gravitational field. This works for any orientation due to the local positional invariance. Of course, there will be a change due to the inevitable quick and abrupt stop for the person on the left. Other than that, there's no way to tell whether you're falling in a uniform gravitational field or truly freely falling Lorentz frame. Things are different when you start on the ground. This is the classic example of the Einstein equivalence principle. The person inside this closed room will feel their weight as they stand up. Apples will fall with 1g acceleration towards the ground. The person will also feel a weight of 1g if the lab is in a rocket accelerating upwards at 1g acceleration. This assumes that our rocket starts accelerating in deep space far away from any planets or stars, and that our experimenters slept through the engine ignition or whatever magic transformed the entire Earth into a rocket in a blink. Given continuing silencers on the rocket, there would be no difference in the effect of the acceleration of a rocket versus the weight of standing on the ground on the Earth. This has interesting consequences. Let's say now you're deep in space, and we'll imagine two observers looking at the same event. One observer is weightless, floating only on a space station and only standing there because of magnetic boots or something. The other is more safely in a rocket, accelerating upwards past the station. Inside the rocket, there are three apples suspended in a row. The space station observer, let's call him Stuart. Stuart sees them in a straight line, which just so happens to line up with some batons. And he has this magical thing with the batons where he lets them go and to do whatever they're going to do. But initially, they're lined up with the batons. The rocket observer, let's call him Elton because he's a rocket man, sees them start off in a row as well at the top of the box of the rocket. As the rocket accelerates upwards, the batons release their magical hold and the apples are allowed to move freely. Note that this is in deep space and the rocket and space station do not have enough mass to be significant gravitational bodies. Let's now say that the two leftmost apples stay put, but let's say that the rightmost apple is given a tiny shove when the batons let go. Now, all three apples are free to move and don't have an initial velocity, and one is moving to the right at, say, a foot per second at constant speed. Let's see what happens. First, we note that Elton feels his weight as the rocket accelerate and Stuart stays floating. Well, he would float off if his mag boots turned off, but he is floating along with his little space station. The apples, according to Elton, appear to be falling towards the floor, but according to Stuart, they're staying in a line with the magic batons. Both see the rightmost apple drift further rightward. The rocket accelerates and picks up speed. Stuart still sees a straight line, but Elton sees them falling faster. Lastly, they hit the floor because the rocket has accelerated up to meet them. Stuart last saw them just before they splattered on impact as still in a straight line, which is what he saw the entire time. But now let's look at a summary of all these steps. As you can see, according to Elton, inside the rocket, the apples fell and the rightmost one traced a parabolic curve downward. This is just like on Earth if you throw something off a ledge. Now let's assume the rocket was accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared and that the rocket's windows are closed. As per the weak equivalence principle, Elton couldn't tell if he was on Earth or in a rocket. And that's the essence of this. This comparison shows that there is a complete equivalence of the two non-inertial, non-free-falling accelerated reference frames. On the left side, it's a rocket accelerated frame, and on the right side, it's a gravitational field, and there's no way to tell the difference, and this is the weak equivalence principle in action. There's no difference at all between inertial mass and gravitational mass. Let's now see the effect on something that does not have mass. And let's go back out to Stewart Space Station. They got good coffee and croissants out there. We reset the test. And now the batons line up with a nozzle of a laser gun. 
This laser gun is fixed at the top of the rocket's hold so that no one gets zapped by the beam inside the rocket. Stewart's batons will make the laser gun fire just as Elton's rocket accelerates on by. While it's in flight, it is not attached to the rocket anyway, so the laser will travel in a straight line along the lines of the batons. Without the rocket there, the laser would go from one baton to the other. One could even imagine, instead of a rocket, a cable pulling up the laser gun with a constant acceleration changing its speed. The laser bolt is not attached to the gun or the rocket in this case. Now let's consult with Elton and see what he measures again. The rocket accelerates upward as the laser bolt moves across the rocket and the rocket rises up to meet it. The rocket goes faster even as the laser bolt speed stays the same, moving towards the other baton in a straight line. Finally, the bolt hits the other side of the rocket by Elton's feet. Stuart, though, is unsurprised. To him, it just went in a straight line but Elton sees something alarmingly different. First, Elton is a bit annoyed with Stuart and his dangerous batons making laser guns shoot inside his rocket, but also the laser bolt bent downward in the rocket's cabin. Now, if instead of a bolt, it were a continuous laser and the rocket kept its acceleration, then the downward bend would be visible as a beam. If Elton starts to decelerate, this laser will, of course, point upward. Finally, if Elton stops or maintains a constant speed, the laser will, of course, now look like a straight line just like it did to Stuart. It is the acceleration that is changing the laser's path. But by the equivalence principle, and you knew this was coming, the equivalence principle states that the same thing would happen on Earth in a uniform gravitational field. Light's path, therefore, will be bent by a gravitational field in exactly the same way as if it were in an accelerating reference frame. There is no difference. Now, light is photons, and photons have no mass. Yet here they are being deflected by gravity, which would quite surprise Newton. The force of gravity as he envisioned it is between two masses. It should only affect masses, but light is deflected even though it has no mass. This effect was predicted by Einstein, and it was subsequently observed by Sir Arthur Eddington as he observed the change in the position of stars during and after a total solar eclipse in 1919. Stars that were visible near the limb of the eclipsed sun were observed to be displaced compared to their positions when the sun was far away in the sky. Eddington and his team looked at them well before the eclipse and carefully mapped their positions. Comparing the images of the positions before and during the eclipse, clearly showed Einstein's predicted deflection. So this is a measured and measurable real effect. Getting back to Stuart and Elton, since we know that Elton's laser made a straight line as seen in an inertial observer's frame, we must conclude that this bent path is the shortest distance for the laser to travel in the accelerated reference frame. Elton and Stuart would, if they could, count exactly the same number of wave crests of the light of the laser beam. As for their wavelengths, Stuart would see them unaltered, would measure them to be unaltered, but Elton would measure them getting shorter as the rocket accelerated. Elton and Stuart both agree that the light has the same speed, and no measurement will tell them otherwise. But Elton will be forced to admit that the shape of straightness is different for him than for Stuart on his magnetic space station. Elton's straight is bent. We are forced to admit that this path is a straight line in both the accelerating rocket and standing on the globe of the Earth. This can only mean that space-time on which light is riding is curved in such a way as to bend the path down towards the acceleration or down gravity slope. Also, in both frames, the total space-time distance is the same for Stuart's measurement from the station or inside Elton's rocket. Specifically, because it's light, that path has a null space-time distance. Therefore, some combination of length contraction and non-uniformity of clock time in these accelerating labs must occur for the speed of light to be a universal constant for all observers. And this is what we mean by curved space-time. Now, let's look closer at how clocks tick inside the rocket because of that non-uniformity of clock time. Once it became accepted that light was an electromagnetic wave, it was clear that the frequency of the light should not change from place to place inside an inertial Lorentz reference frame. 
because waves from a source with a fixed frequency will keep that same frequency everywhere unless they change media, like space to water or space to air. But what if time itself were altered and clocks at different points in spacetime ran at different rates? In 1917, this is precisely what Einstein concluded would occur in an accelerating box. Here we're going to use the rocket again with Elton in it and work with the special theory of relativity. We'll check the clock rate at the bottom of the box, i.e. the side away from the direction of acceleration. Now we check the tick rate on the side towards the direction of acceleration, that is, the top. Let's call up direction x in a frame moving in the x direction with a velocity v relative to some rest frame. For this rest frame, we'll use the bottom of the rocket. Now we check the clock at a nearby position upwards, dx. So to a first order approximation, t sub dx is about equal to dx over c times v over c. That's what you get by looking closely at the Lorentz transformation we see above, letting t tick be the time a little bit higher up than the lower clock's time t. Now we take into account the acceleration g, which would change the speed by g times dt. Here, dt is a little change in the clock on the floor. This makes the clock at the position a little bit higher to be ahead by dx over c times g over c times dt. Looking closely, we see these stacked up clocks have different tick rates. The tick rate r, a little bit higher up in the rocket, is slower by g over c squared times dx, where dx is the amount of distance a little bit higher up in the rocket. The equivalence principle implies that this change in the clock rate is the same whether the measured acceleration g is due to an accelerated frame without gravitational effects, like a rocket, or caused by a gravitational field in a physically stationary laboratory. Yes, that means clocks high up in orbit around the Earth run slower than those on the ground. And this has to be taken into account for GPS satellites. If it weren't, the satellites would be wrong by a meter within minutes, and they'd be off by miles very soon thereafter. Because of this clock slowdown, Einstein predicted that a uniform gravitational field would also cause a redshift. The laser is emitted as blue light at the bottom from our laser gun and is redshifted by the time it gets to the top as the rocket accelerates. Again, this is Elton going by Stuart, and Stuart keeps saying, okay, when you finally get done showing off, let's have a hamburger. The station's burgers are made with bison and elk. And as the rocket accelerates, the top recedes away from the approaching laser, eventually the crossing the distance from bottom to top. Another way of analyzing is from Stuart's perspective. Here, the spatial distance is much greater between the batons. And because it's a laser, the space-time difference in both frames is identical, specifically zero. This means that both Elton and Stuart will count the same number of wave crests traversing the distances they see. Elton's is a non-inertial accelerating frame, and Stuart's is an inertial Lorentz frame. This all means that the frequency of the laser must decrease so that it traverses a shorter distance. This frequency change lengthens the wavelength, making the effective space inside the rocket larger. Therefore, when the laser reaches the top, it's going to be stretched out in its wavelength. Remember that both observers will measure exactly the same number of wave crests, and therefore events, in the laser in their detectors. The accelerated, non-inertial observer will measure a laser that has a lower frequency at the top than compared to the bottom. And by the equivalence principle, this is exactly the same as what would happen in a gravitational field. So now let's depart from these thought experiments and examine a real-world experiment that doesn't involve rockets and closed rooms. Imagine you take a ball and drop it from a great height. When it hits the ground, it will have acquired energy from its fall specifically mgh, where m is the mass of the ball, g is the Earth's gravitational acceleration, and h is the distance fallen. If you add this energy to the rest mass energy of the ball, mc squared, you get the total energy of the ball as it's fallen. Now, let's say we have a magic box that transforms all the energy of the ball, rest and kinetic energy from the fall, into a single photon with an energy h nu which then rises back towards where the ball came from. 
A receiver magic box at the top of the tower then converts all of this photon's energy into the rest mass of a new ball, and this new ball has more rest mass because it has acquired that new energy from the fall MGH. So now, if you put this in a loop, you'd have a perfect perpetual motion machine. And since we never really like the idea of getting something for nothing or your kicks for free and find the perpetual motion generally bad, the best we should be able to hope for is the simple recovery of the original ball with mass m and rest energy mc squared. This means that the energy of the photon received at the top h nu tick must be less than what it had when it was created at the bottom. This energy loss from bottom to top is roughly gh over c squared. This was Einstein's original reasoning that led him to know that there must be some kind of energy loss as photons rise out of a gravitational field. This is an excellent example of the Einstein equivalence principle at work because it explicitly uses the electromagnetic radiation in a lab setting rather than just masses freely falling. Then came along the Mossbauer effect. In 1958, Rudolf Mossbauer, while spectroscopically analyzing a gamma-ray nuclear transition of iridium-191, discovered that if he cooled the emitter down to 90 Kelvin, then the nuclei would not recoil when they emitted such high-energy photons. This recoilless gamma emission allowed another iridium-191 nucleus in a distant detector to absorb the photon in a resonant manner, completely absorbing the photon into the nucleus and going into an excited state. This had never been observed before because the recoil is usually so large that the gamma ray is Doppler shifted on emission to be the completely wrong energy to excite a distant iridium-191 nucleus out of its ground or unexcited state. With this process, if you wanted to check for the absorption at a frequency just a little bit higher or lower than the resonance, then you have to find some way of moving the detector either towards or away from the source at a speed that would make a Doppler effect to the desired amount. In 1959, Harvard's Robert Pound and his graduate student Glenn Rebka devised a plan to use the Mossbauer effect to measure the very tiny gravitational redshift that should occur as a photon rose up 22.6 meters from the bottom of a tower to the top. To get this Doppler shift, they used an audio speaker magnet to vibrate a sheet covered in a material that could receive the photon. Many materials were shown to be able to do recoilless gamma emission by this time, so Pounded Rebka chose Iron 57. It was easy to use and didn't have to be cryogenically cooled. By 1960, they were able to measure this very tiny shift, 5.1 times 10 to the minus 15th, thus proving the Einstein equivalence principle. In 1964, Pound and his colleague Snyder made great experimental improvements, raising the precision from two decimal places to 70 parts in a million. Here, we see that the formula shows how small that shift should be. 9.8 meters per second squared times 22.6 meters divided by 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 15th. This begs the question, is there a setup on Earth where the redshift will not occur? That is, can we use a special relativistic Lorentz inertial frame on Earth? Let's see if we can find such a frame. First, let's pretend initially that one does in fact exist. To help us, we use a special relativistic space-time diagram. Time ticks going up the vertical axis, space is going higher to the right. That's normal for space-time diagrams, don't fret it. What we really want to know though is, could there be any frame where the frequency does not change? Here, we're assuming that in this diagram, we found one. So let's see how that works out. When the photon is emitted, it's a packet of waves, or a wavelet. It will have crests of the waves inside of a single photon. There will then be some tiny interval of time between successive crests of the photon's wave packet. In such a frame, as the photon rises up to the top of the tower, left to right in this diagram, gravity could be doing any old thing. But the first wave crest travels the lower green line, and the second wave crest travels the top one. Now, as the photon rises along the way, gravity might do something to it, but gravity is not time variant along this path. Therefore, both paths will be affected in the same way on the same trip. The green lines are made deliberately goofy because we don't want to make any assumptions of what gravity might look like in this region. But, both wave crests will feel it identically in our putative at-rest reference frame. 
Therefore, when the photon goes to the top in the no redshift Lorentz frame, the tiny time changes between the crests will not change. However, from both the heuristic arguments and Pound, Rebka, and Snyder's work, we see conclusively that the frequency shift up to the top of the tower means that the wave crests have spread out and that the delta t's must change. Therefore, special relativity and Lorentz frames do not apply to the Earth or to any location with a uniform gravitational field. They also don't work if we take into account tidal forces from non-uniform fields. We could do better than a little diagram to demonstrate this mathematically. Using the standard Lorentz transformation of special relativity that I discussed at length in the previous lecture, we can derive the time difference due to transforming from one frame to another moving frame with some constant velocity relative to the original frame. We see at the end that the Lorentz transformation depends on some constant speed to give the difference in the passage of time as measured by clocks in different frames. However, the pound repka experiment shows that the time difference depends on the height in a constant gravitational field. This means every little height difference would need to be represented by a different Lorentz transformation with a different speed. We're now stuck. We can't just find one Lorentz frame to do it all for the Earth. We have to find a different one for every tiny bit of height difference. What a mess! Okay, so if we can't have a constant velocity frame, what if we created a frame that exhibited a constant acceleration? If we abandon inertial frames and just use some non-inertial accelerated falling frame, then maybe we can do it. And that's what I'm trying to represent by these falling boxes. It's not that one box is the frame, but rather that the reference frame itself is under constant acceleration at a given point. This also helps us remember that reference frames can be simple mathematical constructs that assist in greater understanding, and they don't have to be able to live in reality to be a correct description. Yeah, how would you actually make a frame that is continuously accelerating at a point such that you can put meters and clocks and reference frames in it? That'd be really hard considering that every other second the frame would be crashing into the, the ground on this particular example. Let's revisit the argument using Lorentz frames, but this time we'll allow the speed of the frame to increase with time. The falling frame starts at zero speed, with the falling frame and the tower to be matched up. The photon starts at zero height and will go up to height h. It'll take h divided by c for the photon to get there, and that'll be the time t that we want to know about. When the photon gets up to h, the frame speed will have increased by g times the time it took for the photon to rise up to height h. Amazingly, comparing the time as measured in the falling frame, t tick, to the time in the tower frame, t, we find that from the standard Lorentz transformation for that moment at that one speed to give a longer t tick. We can remember that frequencies are inversely proportional to time intervals, so Nu sub tick is the frequency measured in the falling non-inertial frame, and nu is the frequency as received at the top of the tower. We can mix in the top equation for nu received. We then find that the downward speed of the non-inertial frame creates a Doppler blue shift, 1 plus gh over c squared, that exactly cancels out the energy loss due to its rising out of a gravitational field. This last approximation arises because that ratio in front of new emit is like 1 minus g squared h squared over c to the fourth. This is what we call a second order effect. Now the first order effect is small, 10 to the minus 15th, so the second order effect would be about 10 to the minus 30th, so we can safely ignore that as completely unmeasurable. Therefore, we conclude that all effects of gravity on all laws of physics are removed in a freely falling frame. Or, much more specifically, that the pound Rebka experiment, to the best of its capability, cannot detect any violation of the assertion of the Einstein equivalence principle's local positional invariance. It's obviously not a test of local Lorentz invariance. We'll chat about more of these tests later. This entire thing is so important, it's worth repeating it. New tick is equal to some fraction times new emit. This fraction is essentially a gravitational blue shift divided by a gravitational redshift. But this ratio is so small that it's practically, in fact, for all intents and purposes, one. 
Therefore, the frequency observed at the top of the tower is the same as if it were the one emitted, so long as you're measuring inside of a freely falling accelerated reference frame. And this is what we mean when we say that the pound Rebke Snyder experiment strongly supports the Einstein equivalence principle. There is simply no measurable redshift in a freely falling frame. Within an accelerating, freely falling frame, exactly cancels out the immeasurable effects of gravity on all laws of physics. It's just like using special relativity in the absence of gravity. All objects in the freely falling frame, regardless of their composition or charge or nuclear properties, are all unaffected by gravity. All laws of nature will use the framework of special relativity in this freely falling frame. Special relativity is the kinematic framework that is known to be extremely accurate when you have no gravity. In some pound Rebka Snyder show that you can't tell the difference between floating deep in space with no discernible gravity and falling in a uniform gravitational field. Let's now contrast that with our argument about Galileo's boat. That boat was not falling. It was either resting at anchor or sailing straight on a glassy sea. And it's quite obvious that Galilean relativity is much more limited in scope. Galileo and Newton both only considered frames of reference that were either fixed with respect to some absolute time or space or were purely relative in speed. Both of them considered the effects of acceleration to be the core method of detecting whether or not your observation point was at rest, whether it was a butterfly smashing into the rear of the hold or a cosmically isolated rotating bucket of water. Neither one of them considered the idea that the effects of acceleration could be canceled by measuring while falling along with that acceleration. This was Einstein's great insight while sitting in that chair in his Swiss patent office. This amazing breakthrough is now central to much of modern physics, especially the study of gravity. It's also pretty important to notice that the Einstein equivalence principle says that Gravity is actually extraordinarily odd and different among all laws of the universe. The electromagnetic force, you only can cancel that force out by using uncharged neutrons. The weak nuclear force cancels the force by not involving, say, neutrinos or W plus bosons. The strong nuclear force, you can cancel it by assuring nothing interacts with quarks. And particles can be at rest while under the available influence of these forces, so long as they don't involve with neutrinos, or they don't have charge, or we're not talking about quarks, they can be at rest even while those forces are present. But you can't cancel gravity, except by freefall. So there's something strange about gravity that says there's something about falling that's really new and different. And therefore, that's why we say that all laws of physics are the same in a freely falling frame and they're identical to special relativity when there's no gravitational fields. Gravity is just fundamentally odd and really different. There's no thing that says, let's turn off the charge on gravity. Let's say we have an anti-gravity um, particle. There is no anti-gravity particle or there's no particle that says, huh, I don't do gravity. It doesn't exist. That's because all particles follow the shape of space-time. But before we get into that for just the briefest bit, let's go quickly over some of the huge number of tests of the equivalence principle. In my video on the Way of Newton, Chapter 3, Section 1, I describe in painful detail the tests of the weak equivalence principle, or the test of universality of freefall. The great original was Etwish's torsion balance, which helped determine the value of g. The most accurate one today is the French ESA mission microscope, which found no violation of the weak equivalence principle to one part in 10 to the 15th. We also covered the Michelson-Morley experiment, which was hunting for the ether wind, but instead led to the observation of local Lorentz invariance, one of the two beating hearts of the Einstein equivalence principle. Dr. Who fans make some comment here. Modern clock timing anisotropy tests validate the local Lorentz invariance to one part in 10 to the 20th. That's an astonishing confirmation. We also went over the local positional invariance test of pound Rebka, but others exist, such as a lack of evidence for the change of fundamental constants of the universe in space and time. As for the strong equivalence principle, this is basically a test that G does not change in space or time. It's important to note that most alternative theories of gravity predict a change in the gravitational constant over time, so this is a hot topic of research. For example, 
Orbital variations due to gravitational self-energy should cause a polarization of solar system orbits called the Noortveld effect. This effect can be and has been sensitively tested by the lunar laser ranging experiment. Up to the limit of one part in 10 to the 13th, there is no Noortveld effect. Another type bound comes from modeling the orbits of binary stars and comparing the results to pulsar timing data. In 2014, astronomers discovered a triple stellar system containing a millisecond pulsar that has two white dwarfs orbiting it. This study also showed no variation in G either. And the best such data comes from studies of the ephemeris of Mars, based on three successive NASA missions, the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. These studies, along with Big Bang nucleosynthesis studies arising from WMAP and Planck, have shown that G cannot have varied by more than 10% since the creation of the universe. These tests are quite extensive, and all have not yet found fault with Einstein's original choices for how gravity should work. That is, gravity is the curvature of space-time, and all known forces obey this curvature, and further, that there are no additional forces in nature to counteract this idea. We have yet to see if the current Hubble tension will have anything to say that contradicts this, though, though there is growing consensus it might. In this last moment for this section, I'll touch on something I've alluded to a number of times in the past hour, that the bent trajectories of falling objects and even light are actually straight lines in curved spacetime. Einstein's theory of gravity is one that can be called a metric theory. This means you can create a method to determine total spacetime distance between two events in spacetime. At the top, I'm showing the Schwarzschild metric for a spherically symmetric spacetime centered on a spherical body, such as a star or planet or black hole with mass m. We define some special things like the Schwarzschild radius, r sub s. Mostly, though, this metric states what the total spacetime interval ds is given changes in time, dt, changes in radial distance from the mass, dr, and changes in rotational orientation around the mass, d omega. We call each of these coefficients associated with the parts dt, dr, and d omega the components of the metric. These are commonly called little g with two Greek letter subscripts. Little g basically describes the shape of spacetime on a point by point basis that surrounds the mass m. We can construct interesting mathematical tools out of the metric, such as gamma, which has the formal title of a Christoffel symbol. It's composed of partial derivatives with respect to each of the coordinates of spacetime. This symbol actually represents a large system of equations and encodes the gradient of the spacetime. Just like a topological map of a mountainous hiking area shows a series of points of altitude, the slope or gradient of the mountain at a given point is determined by how close together the lines of the same height are placed on the map. The Christoffel symbols encode the points of the metric into the gradient of spacetime. So what happens when you let something roll down the mountain? For ease, pretend that the slope is free of small rocks and anvils, coyotes and roadrunners, and the ball will go faster and slower down the slope as it encounters the lay of the land. It will also trace a distinct path on the ground, given initial placement and some speed in some direction. At the bottom, we see the geodesic equation of motion for force-free motion through a metric space. The first term is the curvature of the trajectory, which is analogous to acceleration. The generalized gradient term is analogous to a force. Therefore, this geodesic equation is the F equals MA of general relativity. That zero at the end means that all free trajectories follow the principle of least action. This means that the path of freely moving particles, or light, will always be one that minimizes the travel time. In practical terms, this describes a straight path of light rays and the straight path of a box sliding across a smooth icy lake. A geodesic is the concept of a straight line in curved spacetime. To help understand this, let's go way back to Euclid's axiom that two straight lines that are initially parallel remain parallel whenever extended. Extended is a funny word here. What does that mean? It does not mean continued in such a way that the distance between them remains constant. Euclid means that, simply, the lines keep going in the direction it was a step before. With this idea, a geodesic is a path described 
by the geodesic equation that if you now place an arrow at any point on the path and move it along a little bit along that path, it'll stay pointing in the same direction. The crazy thing about this idea is that if you have a flat space, like everyone's idea of 10th grade geometry, and you take an arrow and keep it pointing in the same direction and take it for a walk around a closed loop like a square or a pentagon, then when you get back to the starting point, the arrow will have the exact same orientation as when it started. However, in a curved space-time, like the Schwarzschild metric, the Christoffel symbols and the geodesic equation combine together to make that arrow change its orientation when it gets back to its starting point. This all means that the downward curvature of the laser in the box is following exactly this space-time metric. This is pure geometry, but not a geo-thing like the Earth, but space and time itself form a manifold that is connected together differently than a flat sheet of paper or cubes or boxes, like you worked with in your old Euclidean geometry from high school. Sadly for us, cosmology has no use for this Schwarzschild metric. We only care about the space-time metric for an isotropic, homogeneous space-time that is either expanding or contracting or standing still. We'll not need the great and wonderful complexity of strong field general relativity until we take a look at the earliest moments of the universe. Next time, we'll be looking at how Einstein describes curvature in greater detail with a strong focus on this homogeneous isotropic spacetime. Until then, I'll leave you with a succinct summary of Einstein's theory of general relativity by John Archibald Wheeler. Spacetime tells matter how to move, and matter tells spacetime how to curve. Thanks for watching. Please like this video, share it around, and subscribe to my channel. And consider becoming one of my YouTube members or even a Patreon supporter. Giving that support means a lot to me and helps me keep going with all of this material. Well, we'll see you next time for Chapter 3, Section 4, Describing Curvature.